And we will be together joining in our opening hymn, How Can I Keep From Singing, verses one, two, and three. Musicians get set up for that offering. Together we continue in our bulletin on page three. You are no longer strangers and sojourners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Alleluia. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Alleluia. The Lord is risen indeed. Come, let us adore him. Alleluia. The Venite. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hands are the caverns of the earth and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his for he made it and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. Psalm 105. Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. 
and make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, and speak of all his marvelous works. Glory in his holy name, and let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Search for the Lord and his strength, continually seek his face. Remember that the marvels he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O offspring of Abraham, his servant, O children of Jacob, his chosen. Then he called for a famine in the land and destroyed the supply of bread. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They bruised his feet in fetters, his neck they put in an iron collar. Until his prediction came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. The king sent and released him, the ruler of the people set him free. He set him as a master over his household, as a ruler, a ruler over all his possessions, to instruct his princes according to his will and to teach his elders wisdom. Hallelujah. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. A song of creation. Glorify the Lord, all you works of the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. In the firmament of his power, glorify the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. Glorify the Lord, you angels, and all powers of the Lord, O heavens and all waters above the heavens, sun and moon and stars of the sky, glorify the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. Glorify the Lord, every shower of rain and fall of dew, all winds and fire and heat, winter and summer, glorify the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. Glorify the Lord, O chill and cold, drops of dew and flakes of snow, frost and cold, ice and sleet, glorify the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. The Lord, O nights and days, O shining light and enfolding dark, storm clouds and thunderbolts, glorify the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. Let us glorify the Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. In the firmament of his power, glorify the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. Reading from the Old Testament, Genesis. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other children because he was the son of his old age. And he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. He answered, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring back word to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. He came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering the fields. The man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. The man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dotan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dotan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hand, saying, Let us not take his life, Reuben said to them. Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin on their way to carry it down to Egypt. 
Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A song of Zechariah. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty savior born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. My child shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the ways of peace. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the New Testament, Romans. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend to heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips, and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart, and so is justified. And one confesses with the mouth, and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame for there is no distinction between jew and greek the same lord is lord of all and is generous to all who call on him for everyone who calls on the name of the lord shall be saved but how are they to call on one in whom they've not believed and how are they to believe in one of whom they've never heard and how are they to hear some, without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart! It is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and began to sink, and he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, you of little faith, why do you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshiping him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I find in my life, I have people who fit into two categories. Those who are deeply entrenched in the church and this world, because frankly, I know quite a few clergy people and members of congregations. And on the other side of my life are all my friends who are either unchurched or have left the church in disappointment and frustration. Having spent 13 years in the Bay Area, an arguably secular area of the country, and frankly, Seattle's not much different. I have known many people who are disillusioned by the church, regardless of denomination. It's easy to see why. Many churches have acted in disappointing ways, through scandals, through hurtful theology, in the name of God, in the name of Christ, great harm has been done. Particularly going to college and then graduate school in Berkeley, I actually encountered many people who had been raised in a church, often an evangelical church or non-denominational church, some of them even the children of clergy themselves. And I often find myself in conversations with my friends who don't do church about why it is that they left. I'm a bit of an anomaly to them. They know me, they like me, they trust me. And they know that our theologies, so to speak, would be somewhat in line. But there are the hurdles of the pain that the church has caused that they cannot get past the pain of women being told to be silent in church, the pain of obedience that was preached. This all comes to mind because this is a particular gospel that has perpetuated such pain. Why do you doubt? Have faith. It's a scripture that when taken at face value, or preached without thought, or preached to be coercive in some way, sets people up for a fairly disappointing situation. Or even worse, a situation where abuse by the church is even easier. Gospels like this are often used by clergy, by preachers, by Christians, to push the idea that we are meant to have blind faith that doubt is a bad thing. It silences people in the pews. It silences people from questioning whether or not all the theologies being spoken of are actually in line with God. 
It can push obedience when preached this way. This gospel has been the spinoff for books and sermons telling people to get out of the boat, to go walk on the water, to have faith that is unfailing, and to cause people to fear what the world would look like if they do not have faith or if they doubt. This is against everything I know and believe of God. Doubt is a good and holy thing. Doubt allows our churches to be nuanced and vibrant. Doubt can allow us into deeper relationship with God. I often say I love to be an Episcopalian because we're not required to check our brains at the door. We are allowed to question. We are allowed to doubt. And yet we encounter this gospel, which requires a fair bit of unpacking. For if doubt is not a bad thing, what exactly is Jesus saying? In the context of the story, we have to know where we've been and where we're going. Jesus just got done feeding the 5,000 plus, because yes, there were pluses there, more than just the 5,000. Exhausted from feeding and caring for the masses, he sends the disciples on ahead of him, and look at what he goes and does. He goes and he prays by himself. He cares for his soul and his spirit. He refuels and is fed. The introversion that he needs to be with God. That even the Son of God needs to refuel for ministry and take care of himself is a whole sermon in and of itself. And then he goes to meet the disciples. Now notice this. The disciples see this figure walking on the water, and that does not scream to them, Jesus, Son of God. Instead, they think it's a ghost. Nothing in what Jesus is doing is part of what they expect the Son of God to be able to do. This is not one of the things foretold that the Savior to come, the Messiah, will walk on water in the midst of a storm. They are frightened. Have you ever been on a boat in the middle of a storm? Waves and wind bashing about? There is no shame in fear. And then to see a figure walking across the water. This is not the God that they are expecting. And frankly, you can see the fingerprints of humanity in this story because it's proving something of Christ's divinity, but doing much more to speak to the disciples and their faith. Interestingly enough, it is not Jesus who initially summons Peter, but Peter saying, if it is you, God, if it is you, Christ, let me come to you. Peter is the one who asks for the test. I don't think the fear he experiences being in the midst of the storm is something to be shamed. Jesus doesn't calm the storm immediately. It says the storm ceases when he gets into the boat. It's unclear. Maybe assume that that is the action of Christ. Writer and theologian Debbie Thomas points to an interesting notion in this scripture. That instead of focusing on it being doubt that sinks Peter, look at it as the place where fear leads us. Fear can lead us to sink. Fear can lead us to lose our footing. Fear is natural. Fear is, to some extent, unavoidable. But fear is very rarely the place where God truly intends us to be. In the end, regardless of any doubt or fear, 
Christ is still present in there. Christ still pulls Peter up from the water. Christ cannot make everything perfect. Christ cannot calm every storm in our lives. Yet Christ can be a companion, can be a companion in our doubt, a companion in our fear even when it causes us to sink. Blind faith and lack of doubt can do so much more harm than good. When I think of conversations with friends, even very recently, seeing them speak on social media of the harms of having religion forced upon them as children, I recognize the work that we as a church have to do. That there is no amount of argument I can have with them to say, look, this is not what I believe. This is not what my church or my denomination believes. There's only so much I can witness to a different way of life, a different way of being Christian. That as much as they know me and love me and trust me, there are harms that cannot be overcome. In the name of Jesus, the church has preached faith. But how many have been driven away by that very preaching? Unable to return because the space for doubt was not given. Because the fear that was perpetuated by blind faith was much greater than any comfort of God. As a church and as Christians, We have a responsibility to sit within the nuanced gospels and scripture readings and to recognize the pain that has come before us in the name of God. This is something we are dealing with in our sacred ground class. The ways one of our readings spoke to the ways in which scriptures were preached to black slaves to force obedience of those who were enslaved to their masters. Great harm can be perpetuated by our scriptures. And the repentance that we do for that and the way we move forward in light of that truth, acknowledging those harms and preaching and interpreting it in a new way will hopefully plant seeds of new faith and new light in the world. It is painful to wrestle with the history that comes with being Christian. It is painful to wrestle with those who have been harmed by a church that so many of us have experienced love and comfort and grace in. Perhaps some of us here, not perhaps, but I know many of us here, carry our own wounds from the church. And by the grace of God, we are still able to come here and find a balm, to find community and to find hope. I pray that we as a congregation and as individuals can be beacons of light, not to chastise those who are sinking but be the ones who will continue to stand and pull one another up to share our own stories of being pulled up without judgment, but with grace, humility, and peace. For in the end, despite every misstep that the disciples take, and they misstep quite a bit, they sink and they fail, Peter himself denies Jesus multiple times and yet is given the keys to the kingdom of God. They are beloved. They are met by Christ where they are. And more so than any blind faith or any lack of doubt, that is the message that we are called to share and spread. That is the good news that we are beloved, that we are accompanied. 
May God's presence and Christ's presence be with us when we sink. May our doubt and our questions be holy and be pieces of our journey to knowing and being in deeper relationship with Christ as we continue in our faith. Amen. We continue together in our bulletin on page 11, saying together and professing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In a moment, we will have an offertory being shared with us by Tom Lamperti today. As a reminder, you are encouraged and welcome to continue to give to the church to support the many ministries that we do to support the outreach and ways in which we continue to be part of our community in the midst of these strange times. In the bulletin, there's information on how to text to give. If you'd like to make use of that, you can always give online through our website as well. Or of course, you can mail things in and we will check our mail and uh, glad with gladness and gratefulness of heart, receive all the gifts that you can give towards God. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself as an offering and a sacrifice to God.
Thank you for that, Tom. We continue together on page 12 of our bulletin. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world, for only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us with your Holy Spirit. Grant to us, Lord, we pray, the Spirit to think and do always those things that are right, that we, who cannot exist without you, may by you be enabled to live according to your will through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. O oh God, you make us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of your Son, our Lord. Give us this day such blessing through our worship of you that the week to come may be spent in your favor through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. We humbly pray you so to guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that in all the cares and occupations of our life, we may not forget you, but may remember that we are ever walking in your sight through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth and live together in your love and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours, especially those celebrating birthdays this week, Hilly Peterson and Ann Sims, and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in mind, body, or spirit, especially those suffering after the explosion in Beirut and those on our prayer list. Mal Clark, Glenn Crosby, Glorian Crosby, Roger Fitzpatrick, Diane Goodman, Lorna Hamill, Hannah Hooper, Rosemary Howell, Kathy Klein, Peter Mackenheimer, Michael Miller, Claire Parkinson, Pam Rhodes, Karen Rowley, Ron Smith, Vicki Smith, Don Snow, Lillian Snow, William Vic Victory, Bob Hayward, Michael Wandell, Julie Wigand, Peter Wiley, and the Reverend Chuck Eddy. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, especially Sue Rawlings and Dixie McConnell and those who mourn, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom.
Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear prayer. our prayer. We lift up all prayers spoken and unspoken for neighbor K.O. Shelton and friend Karen Blankenship, where they were added to hospice care this week. Prayers and healing and comfort for the people of Menlo Church. Prayers for the successful chemotherapy. Prayers for those who are affected by COVID-19 and for those who have lost loved ones to COVID-19. And for all other prayers that we share and hold on our hearts, that they may always be heard by God. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross, that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you for the honor of your name. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you've given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you've promised through your well-beloved son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Together, we are going to join in our closing hymn on page 15 of our bulletin, Take My Hand, Precious Lord. Precious Lord, take my heart. 
We continue on page 16. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of our, the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. As our musicians get ready, we will hear a postlude from Caroline and Kevin. Stick around. We will have announcements after that and an option for you to go into small groups for coffee hour. So I hope you will stay for that. Thank <laughs> you. 